looks to this person, who, who do we obligate ourselves to? Uh, who who's, who uh, have we committed our lives to? And what do, what do those people say about who we are? Um, because, you know, resumes are resumes. They're meant to sound good. Um, so we're here today. And uh, it is a pleasure to be to look out into your faces and to uh, to remember when I was where you are, except not here. Uh, I went to school at a small Christian college uh, in Huntsville, Alabama. So I was educated in the South as well. And, and there is a, there's some camaraderie that we have. There's things we, we automatically know about each other because we, we are spending these years, you are spending these years, and I spent these same years in, in, in a place in the Deep South, right, with all of its history. Um, there are things we understand. Um, and so I'm going to speak like I know you. Uh, and, and, and I hope that's not offensive, because we haven't had a chance to spend much time together, and we haven't built that kind of rapport, but there's there's something about being in the South that, that, that shapes us in a certain way, even if we, we weren't born or raised here, it shapes us in a certain way. Um, we are people of a particular story, and uh, so, so that's what Stephanie invited me to come and, and, and to speak about, to speak about story and how it shapes us and how we tell our stories. Um, let's see if we have some commonality in our story a little bit. Um, how many people here grew up growing, going to church? Okay, so people who grew up going to church. Um, for those who, of you who did not, that is not a problem. Uh, however, you may not be able to tap into this one little piece of what I'm going to talk about for a second. And that is, uh, how many of you remember those, those songs you used to sing at church and in Sunday school or whatever. And, and now this is what I don't know. I grew up fundamentalist. I, I grew up uh, as, as a Seventh-day Adventist. And so I'm not sure about the, the Baptist tradition. Did you all ever sing the song Father Abraham? Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them. And so are you. Did you sing that? So let's all praise the Lord. Right on, Father. Many sons. You remember that one? Now y'all believe me hanging. Many sons have Father Abraham. I am one of them. And so are you. And even you who weren't a part of this, you can get into this party. So let's all praise the Lord. Right on, left on, Father Abraham. And many sons, yeah, man, we start working out, man. You gotta love it, man. You gotta love it. Ignore that 
part of the story as if it doesn't matter. I mean, come on now. That part of the story has to matter. You know, in this day and age where, 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 where uh, uh, sexual violence against women is at an all-time high on college campuses, how in the world do we trace our sense of faith and in relationship, our sense, our, our sense of what's right in our place in the world, how do we trace it back to a man who did this very thing? For those of you who don't know the story, uh, Abraham had this promise that was given to him. The promise was uh, that, that that's getting a little hot. You might want to turn it down a little bit. Uh, the promise was that he uh, that that he would be the father of many nations, right? And and, and that's not the end of the story. The, the 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 important part is actually that he would be blessed so that he could be a blessing to the world. That's the important part, but. But, you know, he would be a father of many nations. Well, you can't be a father of many nations. I mean, like the, the description, the metaphor that's given, your, your, your lineage, your, your, your children will be like the stars of the heaven. Right? Your, 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 your children will be like the sands upon the seashore. This was the promise that was given to him. He says, and through you all the families of the earth will be blessed. And so, so, so. Abraham had this one problem. You can't be the father of many nations if you can't have one kid first. Right? So Abraham couldn't, couldn't manage to muster one kid. Right? So his wife came up with this idea. I know what we'll do. We'll take this slave girl now. This slave girl we got in Egypt. We're going to take her and, and I'm going to give her to you as if she were Sarah's to give. I'm going to give her to you and you're going to sleep with her. And, and, and the child that comes from that union, that'll be your heir. And so Abraham says, okay. And he goes and he sleeps with this girl. And uh, we, don't, we don't know anything about her story. Like the story is told from, from the guy in power, right? From his point of view. And, and, and his family's telling of the story, right? And so we don't know what that relationship was. We don't know whether it was a violent experience, whether... She just acquiesced to it. We don't know what happened. What we do know is that she became pregnant and she had a child. And that child's name was Ishmael. And Ishmael, uh, he, 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 he was a, he was, he was a, a man's, he was a, he was a, what fathers want in their sons. You know, I mean, he was athletic. And he was, he, he loved the things that his daddy loved. And he loved, and, and, and so, so there was this bond, this, this, this immediate bond between Abraham and this child, which then created a bond between Abraham and this woman he had raped. And Sarah watched this over time and got jealous. Right now, Sarah eventually has a child. She has a, Sarah has a child, his name is Isaac. And we get this story through Isaac's lineage, right? But Sarah eventually has a child, and she's seeing how Abraham is favoring the older child a little bit, and she sees how, how the older child treats the younger child because they're brothers. That's what brothers do. You know, they pick on each other, right? How many of you have brothers? Did you get picked on? Did you do some picking on? Anyone not? That's what brothers do. So, you know, I mean, this is what is going on here. And, and, and she gets jealous and she says, Abraham, you got to get rid of them. You got to get rid of them. I don't care where they go. They got to go away from you. So Abraham, Abraham wouldn't even do it himself. He got his, he got his servant, uh, uh, Ebenezer. He, he, he got him to, to carry them off. And, and again, we don't know how the story went down. You know, if someone's telling you they're, they're going to take you out into the desert and leave you there, are you fighting? Are you fighting to stay? Of course you are. So odds are he, they, they were battered and gagged and, and dragged off into the night and taken far enough away so that they couldn't make their way back in time, right, to catch the Abraham's, Abraham's family before they moved. These, these were nomadic people. Abraham rolled deep, right? Abraham had lots of cattle and lot 
flocks of sheep. I mean, they rolled deep like he was rich. Like this man was like Mansa Musa. When he came to a place, he changed the economy, right? So, so, so it had to be far enough away, far enough out, where, where they couldn't get back before he was able to move off somewhere and couldn't be found. But this is what happened. This is that story. And we celebrate this story. How dare we celebrate this story at a time when whether or not we have a convenient excuse to implicate them, we go after, we have spent the last 50 years in war with, with the children of this man Ishmael. And that war has claimed lives, life after life, particularly in your lifetime, right? The whole 9-11 and post-9-11 stuff, we have been in war with the children that came from this event. How dare we claim Abraham? How dare we say, Father Abraham, and I am one of them, and so are you. And not recognize that Ishmael and his, his, his mother, Hagar, were black and brown bodies that had been cast to the side. In this time when we have to, we, 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 when so many black and brown bodies are piling up in the street that we have to say to ourselves, black lives matter, just to keep it at the forefront of our mind. Abraham threw black and brown bodies to the wind. How dare we claim Abraham? How dare we claim him and then not at least tell that part of the story? But we have to claim Abraham. Like, you don't get to not claim him. You don't get to say, man, you know, that sucks. I'm going to walk away from Abraham. You don't get to do that. You don't get to do it because you benefited from Abraham. Even if you turn your back on this particular faith tradition, Abraham is part of your story. You have to claim it. Because whether you are Christian or Muslim or Jew, whether you are... Whether, whether, even if you're none of these, even if you're agnostic or atheist or Hindu or Buddhist, the fact that you go to school in this place that was built on a promise given to Abraham that privileges you, that alone privileges you in a way that others are not privileged. Do you understand what I'm saying here? Like this Abraham story is a part of your legacy whether you like it or not. And even if your story is wrapped up in something else, because you are here, because you are here, you have been given access to a particular kind of privilege in the world. Even if your only privilege is that you understand the story. You share the story. You're able to trade in the language of the story. You have been privileged in a way that those who left behind back at home are not. So you have to claim this story. You have to know this story. You have to understand this story. You have to reveal this story. That is your task. As people who benefit from a particular story, you have to redeem the story. So we're here. We're at Mars Hill. Mars Hill has a particular story. It's a story that is so fascinating. And what's most fascinating 
is that it is not unique. Although we tell it as if it is. It is the quintessential Southern story. Mars Hill was the brainchild of several, several men, among them J.W. Anderson. Anybody know this story? Y'all know this story? Right? Those of you who don't know this story, learn this story. Right? Among them was J.W. Anderson. J.W. Anderson was on the board of Mars Hill, the, one, the founding board of Mars Hill. And uh, back then, of course, it wouldn't have been called Mars Hill University. It took a few years to get that. Right? But, but he was on the founding board. In fact, he was the secretary of the board. J.W. Anderson and his friends had gotten together and said, we're going to build a school. And this is what we're going to do. We're going to put it here. In this part of western Georgia. I mean, excuse me, western South, uh, North Carolina. I'm sorry, I'm from Georgia. Right? In this part of western North Carolina. Right? And uh, we are going to, uh, and we need a building. This is what we need. We're good Baptist folk. We got faith. Right? God will provide. We need a building. Right, so we're gonna put, we're gonna pool our resources. We're gonna get this building built. There was a guy, and I guess I should have my notes by now, but I don't. There we go. All right, there was a guy by the name of uh, what was his name? Ethel. Oh dear, let's go find him. His name was. You, you gotta know his name. You should know his name. He's important. His uh, here it is. His name. was Ephraim, oh there, here it is, Ephraim Clayton. And uh, Ephraim Clayton was pretty famous in this, this area of town. He was famous. His dad had moved here during, uh, during right before uh, the Revolutionary War. So this is way, way back, right? Right before the Revolutionary War, his daddy had moved here from Delaware. And he came down, and, and for those of you who read history books where they say, and they settled this land, that is code for they killed everybody that was on the land <laughs> until they drove them out. Right? They staked the claim on this land. And, and it wasn't just, oh, this land is here. Let me go claim it. No, it was, this is as large a swath of land as I can defend. Right? So that's what his daddy did. Claimed a big old portion of western North Carolina. Right? And so his daddy was a pretty important guy, and, and you know, he was kind of made like the, 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 the guy who kind of originally got the charter for North Carolina, kind of kind of made sure that he became, that, that, that this, this Clayton character's daddy became uh, 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 the, the first justice of the peace in this area. Language matters, right? First justice of the peace in this area. <laughs> Genocidal maniac is more what he was. But anyway, right? So, so this was his story. So this guy had a son. His son was Ephraim. His, it, it, he had another son. His other son was, was, was in, uh, in, in, in the uh, legislature for North Carolina for many years, right? So Ephraim was well-connected and Ephraim was well-financed. Ephraim built a lot of state houses and courthouses and, and built college buildings in the South. He built residences in the South. He was the mayor. So if you wanted your place built, you went to Ephraim Clay. J.W. Anderson and the people who founded Mars Hill were well connected enough that they were able to go to Ephraim Clayton. And Ephraim Clayton said, okay, I'll build your building. Now Ephraim wasn't a, the building they were building was a brick building. Anybody know what the first building is? Which, which hall is it? Founders Hall, that's easy, right? And so Founders Hall, right? So, so they needed, he needed some bricks, right? So Ephraim, Ephraim was a carpenter. Ephraim hooked up with a guy by the name of George Shack, Shackleford. George Shackleford was a, was a mason, right? He was a brick mason. And so he came, they got together, they said, okay, we're going to build this building for you. They built the building. The building was completed in 1856, right? The building was completed. It was great. Woo, we, we, we did it. But it cost more. They had cost over money. Those of you who are building new buildings next door, you want to get familiar with this language here, 
right? There were cost overruns, right? And so the building ended up costing about a third more than they anticipated. So, you know, Ephraim wasn't, he, he wasn't too worried. He, he said, you know, he'd give them time. And, and the founders of the school, they said they, they'd get that money together. It was about $1,100 at the time. Uh, and uh, they didn't get it together. They didn't get it together. I don't know why. It might not have been important to them. It might have been other things that were more important. Right? And you're trying to start a school. You're trying to get it going. Right? So, so what, what, what they did was they put it off and put it off. And finally, Ephraim, Ephraim Clayton and, and, and this guy Shackelford came back and said, mm, we, need to, we need to get our money. Now, here's where it gets a little tricky. The question is, did they come back for the money? Or did they come back for Joe Anderson? See, it was three years. Three years. And they came back for the money. And I promise you, there was more than one slave on this property. There was more than one enslaved person on this property. There were many enslaved people on this property. In fact, J.W. Anderson alone, I think he owned, he, 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 he had enslaved like seven, eight people, right? He held in captivity seven or eight people. So what made Joe the person you come back? You come back, you want your money, right? You want your money. Hey, I, can I get my money? You didn't give me, all right, we're going uh, to take that one right there. And they randomly picked Joe Anderson. They randomly picked the guy who was probably the best brick mason in Madison County. Now, of course, the way it's remembered is he was just a brick maker because that requires so much skill. You get that, right? Because he had no privilege, right? Because this other guy is actually known as the brick mason, right? Shackleford is known as the brick mason. Joe Anderson can't get credit for being a brick mason. It's the times in which they lived. So he was called a brick maker. And he was the best brick maker in Madison County. Nobody else could bring together those little bricks and make them nice and square. No. I think these brothers came back looking for Joe Anderson. I think Joe Anderson had made that job here easy. And they said, listen. We might want him rather than his money here. Right? Because he can make some money for us. Right? So they grab, they, they, they put a lien on the building, they get the sheriff to come over here and get Joe Anderson. Joe Anderson is taken off in, in 1859. And then the way the story is handed down to us, everybody got about their business. Oh, we love Joe. We need to bring Joe back. Good old Joe. Right? We need to get Joe back so everybody got about their business and started scraping together their little pennies and nickels. We're going to bring Joe. The black folk had a fish fry. <laughs> you know, we're going to get Joe back. And Joe's friends marched down and gave the money. And Joe was returned to his family. No! That's not that story. That's not that time. Context shapes meaning. Context shapes meaning. And the context of that time is that Joe was a capital gain. And then for J.W. Anderson, Joe was a capital loss. And J.W. Anderson wasn't going to take that loss. And he was going to do whatever it took to get that money back. And I'm sure he banged on a few doors and stood on a few desks telling his colleagues, we, we're going to get Joe back. Joe makes me some money. We're going to get Joe back. And they went and they got Joe. But it wasn't a moral thing. It wasn't love. It wasn't, it, it wasn't, oh, this is the right thing to do. Because Joe doesn't belong behind bars. This man is enslaved. Captivity was the mainstay of his life. They went and they got their money. And they brought Joe back. And the way the story tends to be told, 
right? And I've read it from lots of different places. Job lived out the rest of his life down on some southern portion of the campus. And he died in peacefully in 1910. That's not the story. Context shapes meaning. This was 1959, so the war doesn't end for another, for, for another four, four years. Black people aren't even recognized under the federal government. The Freedmen's Bureau isn't created until 1865. Then you have Reconstruction. And you need labor to reconstruct a thing. You need skilled labor. Joe was an investment in the future. And then the South, the North, the Union was driven out of the South, and we have Jim Crow. And Joe doesn't die peacefully in 1910. He dies in the midst of, 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 of racial hatred and turmoil. Where the old order is being reestablished here. This isn't some other white folk in some other place. This is here in the South, my friends, that this is happening. And he dies in the midst of that. He was a tenant farmer, we say, which is another way of saying sharecropper, which is another way of saying slavery by another name. Joe lived out his life. The school, the founders of the school missed an opportunity to get some things right. But it came back, folks. It came back. 60 years later, there was a professor on this campus. His name was Walter Johnson. And Walter Johnson made this, this call to uh, Mars Hill and to the surrounding valley. He said, listen. Our call, our charge is to be stewards. This is the gospel charge, to be stewards and not owners. He went back to this deeply embedded ethic that somehow you could own and exploit and still be in God's favor. And he said, no, we're called to something better. And he, he, he made that charge. He, he, he. He said those things for 20, 30 years. And the school facilitated people meeting here and talking about it and stuff. But people, again, this is the Jim Crow South. He was one of many voices and he lost. He lost. And we know he lost because we know the story of Joe Anderson's great, great granddaughter who was the first African-American student and first person of any color that wasn't of European descent to be admitted here at Mars Hill. And she tells the story of how she almost didn't even get it. Even with her ties to this land, she grew up on this land and, and, and the expectation was she would have to go somewhere else. She was ignored and, 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 and belittled and, 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 and and, and, and just alienated year in and year out. Which means that Walter Johnson's call to be a steward had not been heeded. Because she was here in the 50s, right? 60s, right? She got here in the 60s. So here we are. You know, lots of things have happened since then. You know, you, you kind of had the split in the Baptist church and you had the Southern Baptist go, and it became really conservative for a while, and Mars Hill kind of followed that for a little bit, stayed connected to the State Baptist Conference, and then, and then recently, like five years ago or so, uh, has, has broken with the State Baptist Conference, and, 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 and so there's this, there's this deeply embedded cycle. The call to rise above what is happening and then this put me down. The call to rise above and then ignore it. This call to rise and then ignore it. And now it's today. And I look at it and I see white folk, black folk. I see some folk that look like they have some uh, Asian American heritage. 
I see some folk that look like they might come from the Middle East. There's folk who have all kinds of stories in their ear. And somehow you found your way here. I don't know how that happens. But somehow you found your way here. And there's this story that is yours whether you want it or not. That you must embrace. It is part of the heritage of this place. When you chose to be here, you chose to become a part of that story. And here is the point of everything I have said. The only way to honor that past is to improve upon it. Scripture says, honor your father and your mother that your days will be long upon the land which the Lord your God gives you. But honoring your father and your mother does not mean you agree. We know that. So we must do that. We know better, so we must do better. We honor our past by improving upon it. When Job was taken, J.W. Anderson had an opportunity to do something for a moral reason, and he chose not to. The economics of it just was too important to him. So, Walter, Walter Johnson comes along and he says, listen, if we are going to get things right, we got to get this thing right around these economics. And, 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 and he gave, he, he stood for the right. And he stood against the wrong. There's no need standing up for the right unless you're going to stand against the wrong. But the school missed that opportunity too. And kind of fell back into certain patterns that were just part of and parcel of what happens here. And over and over, the, 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 this opportunity to rise above, to set an example, to be, to live out the true meaning of its creed. What is the school called? What's the name of the school? Mars Hill. It is Mars Hill. Does anybody know where that name comes from? Where does it come from? Book of huh? Acts. What? The Book of Acts. The Book of Acts. It comes from the Book of Acts. Mars Hill was the place that this guy Paul, Paul the Apostle, goes and he says, listen Greeks, there's this thing that has happened that is a uniquely Jewish story that is a story though that is open to you. And you can enter into this story because this story is the story of the thing that you've been after that you didn't know how to name. And now if you enter into it, then here's what happens. You, instead of uh, uh, embracing Caesar as your king, you become one who embraces a higher king. The king of a kingdom the, whose builder and maker is God. This, you, you become committed to a different way of walking in the world and being in the world. Mars Hill has, has been called to be a place that cultivates people who have this different way of being in the world. And it is your job to make that the story of Mars. So, I'll leave you with, with a couple things. Let me go and put it up here on the screen. Is this thing still on? Let me do a plug that up for you. And I'll start talking a little bit. A little, a little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, this is how this works. If you're going to tell a better story, if you're going to honor the past, by improving upon it, there's a couple things you're going to have to do. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you five. And if they come up great, if they don't, that's all right. First thing you're going to have to do is you're going to have to re-narrate the story and eliminate the coded language. You have to tell it with the forthrightness that is expected of today. Right? 
you got to tell it what the fourth right is that is expected of it, in, of, as, of it today. Because in it, you will start to hear the things that you need to start bringing it to be if you learn to tell it. Second thing you're going to have to do is uh, you're going to have to learn to listen and adjust when current students start to tell their stories of how they're feeling marginalized in this place. You're going to have to listen. And you're going to have to adjust. And I guess I'm talking to staff and faculty now. You're going to have to listen. You're going to have to make adjustments. The things that created the past still exist. Right? The story continues. And it's not enough to stand up against the thing that used to be. No one here is still in favor of slavery. Right? I don't think so. No one here is still in favor of Jim Crow. Right? So, but you get no brownie points for that. That's the story of a, of a time long gone. You got to stand up against what is now. Right? Um, another thing is, you got to recruit. The only way you start to reshape the narrative is if you, you start recruiting for critical mass. Right? So, this is what I'm saying. It's not enough to get a representative phase on anything. If you do a search for people to participate in something and you don't get at least 30% of, of the voices that were absent from the table, then that's a failed search. You got to go back at it. And I'm talking about faculty and staff too. Right? The only way you, 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 you tell a different story is if you start to put people, different people in play in the story. I'm not going to ever get invited back. Next. <laughs> right? I've got two more things. Right? You've got to organize and execute around your priorities. So whatever you establish as your priorities here at the school for re-narrating this story, you've got to organize and execute around it. Let me tell you three that I know exist on campus right now. One is safe haven. Right? One is safe haven. One is, one is the NAACP, and another is, another is Better Together. These are three organizations that are seeking to re-narrate what it means to be a student at Mars Hill, and Safe Haven is in jeopardy of not existing as of tomorrow. Because there are not enough people involved. To make it a legitimate campus, campus, a legitimate campus club. If you want a different story, you have to organize and execute around your priorities. If it is your priority to create a space, a safe haven for people who are queer, for our LGBTQ friends, then you need to support safe haven. Period. In the sentence, full stop. Lastly, if you're going to honor the past by improving upon it, then you have to recognize that after all these efforts, people have every reason still not to trust. Now, I mean, and, and that's for real, right? Because we have stories that have persisted for a long time. And you take it one little itty, 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 itty step towards a different direction. Isn't enough to earn trust. You got to get in that thing. And you got to be about that thing for a long time. You got to be committed to that thing. Right? I can tell more and more stories related to it. I won't. I'm done. We're gonna close. Uh, we're gonna close out uh, by not. Uh, singing that last song that was on the agenda because I went to know. Right? But I am going to say this. Somebody said they want to hear that last song? Yeah. Let's hear that song up there. Come on. They don't have time. I, I, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not. See, I got no juice. No. Next week. Next week. Next song's coming. Right? Or they can stand right out there and do it like you used to do it on the corner, baby. <laughs> Bring it. Right? All right. I, 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 
just snobs. My dad used to beat up Marvin Gaye because he wanted to sing in his group on the corner. Right? They grew up in D.C. together, right? So that's how you do it. You might get famous. Just stand in that right over Right? So I'm going to say go in grace. And go in peace and go in love and go in the commitment to not just talk about it, to be about it. To rewrite this narrative that is Mars Hill. Blessings on you. I appreciate you and thank you for letting me be here.